Well, good morning. I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word with me this morning to the book of Colossians, chapter 4, Colossians 4. As Pastor Mike just said, um, uh, Pastor Jerry was not, as it turns out, the man for our presbytery. We, um, we do want to be prayerful uh, for God's plan, for his work, not just in our own church, but, but in our region, in our presbytery in, in Northern California and Nevada. So I, I, I will ask again with Pastor Mike, that would you just continue to be in prayer about this? It's something, whether God sends a, a missionary to come and plant churches or whether churches just grow up and we just need to find ministers, that, that God would show us a way that we can be faithful ministers and churches in our region. Thank you for, for doing that. So again, we're going to Colossians chapter 4, and this is the, the end of the road as far as Colossians goes. We're in the final section here. Paul has written this letter to the church at Colossae. He calls them saints, holy ones. He's told them many things. We've gone over these the last uh, number of months. We've been going through this book a bit slowly, and now we come to the end. And as, as in many of Paul's letters, the end continues with, with a list of names and greetings but don't let your eyes glaze over here. This is God's word. It's useful for us. It's for our good, and it's God-given. So would you please now give your attention to the reading of God's word from the book of Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom... You've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. The word of the Lord. As I said a moment ago, this is the end of the line for Colossians, at least for now. We've come to the end of this series, and sometimes you come to the end of a sermon series, and you, that's when the, the question you should have asked at the very beginning kind of pops into your head. What am I going to call this? What would, if we had a title, we don't at Delta Oaks, we don't typically have titles or always have titles for our sermon series. Just call them Colossians or call it Matthew but if we were going to call this ser series through Colossians by a title, what would you call it? I'll just take a moment for a second. Think about that silently to yourselves. If you had to sum up the book of Colossians in a title, in a phrase, or in just a, a word even, what would you call it? I hope you're thinking. Now, so I have a couple suggestions if you're, if you're stumped. I mean, one place you could go is you, you could go to the letter's opening and you'd say, well, Paul greets them and he says he's so encouraged by the knowledge of their faith, their love, which is founded on their hope. So you could call it the, the Hope Founded Faith and Love series. And that's really something that he, he unpacks and bears out in the rest of the letter. But I think that that could be said about a lot of his letters, so let's move on from that. Maybe we could say 
This is a, um, this is a letter about the makings of a mature faith. Paul says that he's been praying for them. That's verse 9 of chapter 1. He says, I've been praying for you that you would know, that you would know the riches of this gospel that you've received, and that you'd grow in maturity. He says in our passage that Epaphras, their pastor, in fact, the one who brought them the gospel, Paul's never visited this church in person. Epaphras is praying for that as well. So the makings of a mature faith, maybe that's the sermon series title. Or, or maybe you could call it, and, and I do like this one, this is one I've seen before, Christ over all. Because again, as we see in chapter 1, Paul has this passion to make it clear to the Colossians that Christ is, his word, preeminent. He made all things, and he is reconciling all things to himself. He is the only Savior, and that makes him sufficient for their salvation. They don't need to go to these other gurus. They don't need to to pick up trendy traditions. They don't need to to follow fasts and, and festivals in order to have a full Christian faith. The fullness of their faith is found in Christ. Christ is over all. And he talks about that. And he tells what tells us what that looks like in in our Christian life. So that's a that's a good title. I like that series title. But this morning I want to suggest to you another title. And it's one that I think becomes particularly clear, at least it became particularly clear to me in this last section here, I think you could call the the sermon series in Colossians full fellowship in the kingdom of God. Full fellowship in the kingdom of God. Fullness is something that the Colossians were concerned about. It's something that the false teachers were trying to sell them, a false fullness. And Paul is giving them a fullness that they have But it's a fullness found in the fact that they have been, what does he say in chapter 1? Transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. It's a kingdom book. In a way, every book of the Bible is a kingdom book. But Paul brings this out in a special way. You even see in our passage here this morning, he, he, he calls some of his fellow workers, fellow workers for what? The kingdom of God. And as we see what the significance of that is for us in a Christian fellowship, we see that that Paul has called them. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. You're members, in other words, he says. You're church members. Now, the Colossians were, were visibly church members. They had a church membership in the church of Colossae. But he calls them the saints in Colossae. He says, you have love for all the saints. And in that, he says, you know that you're not just members of the church here in Colossae but that you're members of the kingdom of God, the church that is invisible in all places, at all times, and everywhere. You have that vital connection in Christ. Christ is the one who has reconciled you. Christ is the one, more than who is just your your fundamental identity as a church, he is your maturity. He's the one who's going to bring you to fullness, to completion in faith. And more than that, he says this Christian faith in the kingdom, this full kingdom living, is a kingdom living in light of the fact that Christ has not just died, therefore we've died to sin. Christ was not only raised, therefore we are raised with him. But Christ is seated in heaven right now on his throne and calls us to be faithful servants to him. We saw this last time, especially as Paul brings this out in the relationships we have. Husbands and wives, parents and children, employers, employees, and are, as he says, masters and slaves. He ultimately says we are all under the same master and under the same Lord. We're servants of the king. We need to be living in light of that fact, that we have kingdom membership as servants of Christ. We need to be praying for the service of that kingdom. And particularly, as Paul outlines again in chapter 4, he says, praying for the gospel to go out richly. Pray for the kingdom to be built. Pray for the, for the, for the ministry of the kingdom and for the ministers in the kingdom, the, those who have been called to preach. Pray for us, Paul says, that we'll be able to speak and be ready yourselves to speak to those that God places in your life. It's very appropriate if this really is a book about full kingdom membership, about fullness and full fellowship in the kingdom of God. 
that then Paul concludes with what I said is typical for him, but actually it's a little atypical in the length of his conclusion of going through his list of ministry partners and sharing their greetings. You see, we see here that he's not just talking in the abstract, he's not just giving commands, but he's actually showing them practically how this service has mattered for him personally and for the Colossians. And going through this list, he's going through beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, men and women who have served and are serving the Colossian church. And Christian, they're they're your brothers and sisters too. Because again, this invisible church knows no bounds in time or space. This is our family. This is our fellowship. And so I think this morning, as we look at this fellowship, I'd actually like to look at each of the names and just look. We, there's so much here we could spend. I've heard someone say you could spend 10 sermons on this, and pastors love to say that, but I think here it is especially true. But we're just going to look at these names briefly and touch on what does Paul observe about them and what do we know about them and how does that show us what we have in this fellowship we have together beneath the king Jesus Christ. So let's start. He, he divides it here in four sections. We'll start in the first section. He introduces us to the letter bearers, or the you could call them the communications team. This is the, the comms team of his ministry, and he, he first begins with Tychicus. Now, Tychicus, we don't, we don't know much about him. In fact, we don't know much about a lot of these folks, but we do know what Paul says here. We know who he is. He calls him a beloved brother, and a faithful minister. He actually uses that word to describe Epaphras at the beginning of the book and here at the end, a faithful minister. There's faithfulness in Tychicus. Tychicus showed up. Tychicus was a part of the church. And Tychicus, more than that, was someone willing to go with Paul and for Paul. Now, at this time, there's, again, lots that we don't necessarily know for sure about the context of Colossians, but I do believe at this time Paul is in Rome in prison. I know he's in prison, at least. He makes that much clear. But I think he's in Rome. And Tychicus was someone who was willing not just to go to Rome with him, but to go from Rome and carrying from Rome these letters. This isn't the days of email. You know, today we just send off an email and it's just easy and, oh, it went into my spam and I'll just go dig it up. No, letters are a big deal in the ancient world and especially for Paul because he is actually sending a letter that is inspired by God. This is God's very word. And Tychicus was faithful enough that he was able to say to him, I trust you. Take it and deliver this message to them. He's not just sent them to bring the letter, though. He's sent them so that they will know how Paul is doing. So it's kind of like the sower and the seed, the little insert that we have, right? How are we doing? How are, how are our friends, our fellows, our, fellows our, our brothers and sisters doing in other places? We don't see them every day. Perhaps the Colossians, again, they hadn't met Paul in person, but they were concerned for him. And so Tychicus is coming to let them know how things are going in Rome and also to encourage their hearts. And that encouragement might have been especially poignant for them because he's bringing with them a man by the name of Onesimus. Now, we've not met, we've not met Onesimus yet. Lord willing, we will when we look at the book of Philemon in the weeks ahead. Onesimus was a slave. More than that, Onesimus was a slave in a wealthy house, probably one of the leading houses in the church of Colossae, the house of Philemon. Philemon was his master. Philemon was a generous, gracious Christian man who had this slave, Onesimus, who was not generous or gracious or Christian. Actually, it looks like he not only, I mean, he fled from his master, which we can sympathize with and understand, but he not only ran, but he actually stole a bunch of stuff and ran off and basically went to the big city. He went to Rome. But it was there in Rome, again, a man, he was a pagan, he wasn't a Christian, he was a thief at this point, It was there in Rome that Onesimus met Paul. And perhaps what Philemon agonized over. I failed to, to, you know, Onesimus ran away more than what he stole. I'm just concerned because I didn't get the gospel to him. I failed him. He was part of my house and I I didn't share with him sufficiently the gospel of grace. Well, in fact, God had a plan for Onesimus. Because in the jail cells with Paul, Onesimus found Christ. And now, Paul calls him Faithful. Faithful and beloved brother. He's one of you. 
he says to the Colossians. He's actually saying that to Philemon, and we'll know that even more. He says that in, in bold, underlined letters to Philemon, he is one of you. In Christ, what has he already said? There, there, there's no slave or free. There's no barbarian or Scythian. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised, but Christ is all. Philemon was important for the church of Colossae. He worked hard for the church of Colossae, but the fact of the matter is his standing is no different than the man who was formerly his slave and who, in fact, at this time, going back to Colossae, is still a slave. Do we realize that? He's actually going to go back. We'll talk about this. And Paul is saying, I, 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 want, you to, I, I want you to receive him as a brother. Realize that he's, he's, he's not just your servant anymore, but the fact is, that whatever our social status, whatever the, the, the past, whatever our past sins and offenses are to one another in the church, Paul says the gospel can make us faithful and beloved. And Onesimus, more than now once having stolen, now comes as a bearer of gifts. He comes to bring this beautiful letter to the Colossians and to bring them news about their beloved Paul. So these are the letter bearers. These are the, the communications team uh, now moving on, next, Paul goes in to talk about some other ministers and other servants that he's working alongside. And in this case, he really gives us a window into a very unlikely alliance. Now, I just said in Christ, there's neither circumcised nor uncircumcised. There's neither Jew nor Greek, in other words. But, but here he really makes it clear for them. He lists three men off the bat, and he says, these men are the only men serving with me who are of the circumcision. In other words, these are, these are my Jewish brothers, and these are the only Jewish brothers I have around me right now. Aristarchus, Justice, and Mark. Now, I, I, we know next to nothing about Justice, Jesus, who is called Justice. Aristarchus, we see he's called a, a fellow prisoner, and if he's the same man identified in the book of Acts, we know that this is a man who's been in the mud with Paul. This is a man who went to Ephesus, and when the riots were breaking out, and when the crowds were pressing in, and when it looks like there was going to be violence against them, Aristarchus was in the thick of it. So Aristarchus is so-called also, he's a fellow prisoner. Some conjecture, I think there's no real evidence for this, but some say it, so I'll say it. Um, some suggest that Aristarchus not only is a fellow prisoner uh, in the sense that he is there with Paul, but he's actually, they think he's there in prison with Paul whether of his own choice because he didn't want to be separated from Paul or because of his witness to the gospel. In either case, Paul uses a word here, not just as a generic prisoner, but he actually uses the word for prisoner of war. He, this is my band of brothers, Paul says. This is, my, this is my fellow prisoner, someone who is willing to suffer for service in Christ's army. But he also includes Mark. And again, if we're not familiar with the book of Acts, it may just kind of glance over us this comment he makes concerning whom uh, you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Well, why does he need to say that? But in fact, we know a little bit about Mark. We know that Mark's mom, Mary, was a, a considerable woman in Jerusalem, that her house was a place of meeting, a church. She had a church building for them, her house. We know that Mark is here, the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas was Paul's, uh, his, his real brother in arms, his companion. They were, they were like thick and thin. When Paul was a baby Christian, Barnabas was there. When people weren't, concern, were, weren't sure about Paul and they were like, this guy was persecuting Christians. Why should we let him in now? Barnabas was vouching for him. They were serving together. They loved each other dearly. I, you, can't, you can't think of a, of a dynamic duo that was more intensely aligned than Paul and Barnabas. But we learn in the book of Acts Ironically, after a very intense conversation, a, 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 a presbytery meeting, actually, a general assembly meeting, where Jews and Gentiles are coming together and trying to figure out how can we get along, and they come to a reconciliation, we, we then ironically find in the very next moment that as Paul and Barnabas are setting out, they're saying, well, should we take Mark with us? And we find out in that passage that, in fact, Mark had gone out with them previously, but that he chickened out, and he ran away. And he failed in the service, in his ministry. So understandably, Barnabas, being the gregarious, the loving person that he is, and especially being the cousin of Mark, says to Paul, I think we should take him along. I think we should give him a second chance. And Paul won't have any of it. 
Actually, Paul says in that moment, he says, you know, th- th- this is not something, like, I can't, de- I can't make this a, this isn't a, a, a scruple, this isn't a, okay, it's not how I would do it. No, this is a deal breaker. Mark cannot come with us. The, the, the gospel of, or the, the account in Acts uh, describes it as a sharp disagreement, and ultimately Paul and Barnabas separate. Barnabas goes one way, Paul goes another. Barnabas takes Mark, Paul takes a man by the name of Silas and, and goes off on his missionary journey. And we know that, that in that fracture, God had a plan. And we see the fruit of that plan if you read the book of Acts and the way that God works it out. But, but here, God gives us an incredible window into the reconciliation that that, that that story has. Paul was the one who wanted nothing to do with Mark. Paul is the one who said to his beloved brother Barnabas, I don't want to have anything to do with you because you want to take Mark. And yet here he says, if you find that Mark comes knocking at your door, receive him. He's with me now. He's with me now. He's faithful now. And this, this relationship, this rocky relationship has been restored. I mean, think about this in our own church. How, how this, this letter, possibly written 10, maybe 15 years after the events of, of the separation between Barnabas and Paul, how amazing is it that, that in all that time, God was working out a plan so that finally Paul, can you imagine telling Paul the day after he separates from Barnabas, you're going to actually write to a church that you've never met and say, hey, this guy, he's with me now, and I want you to receive him. It's an incredible testimony to the reconciliation. God in Christ, who is reconciling all things, can reconcile even the rockiest relationships. And as far as Mark is concerned, it should be an encouragement to us, those of us who find ourselves failing at times. We weren't willing to be faithful. We weren't willing to go the distance for Christ. Well, God is able to even cover over those sins as well and restore us to the fellowship. You know, you think, uh, I, maybe some of you caught the, the, the opaque allusion to Lord of the Rings in the sermon title, The Fellowship of the King. Uh, you think in the Lord of the Rings, there's this, this figure of Boromir who actually, in a way, fails, but in the end, is restored and is redeemed. And shame on us if we look in the church and we see folks or we've seen church, uh, church members who have left our company and we say there's no hope for them. Shame on us. Because there's always hope when Christ is at, is at the helm. And we should be praying to that end. So those are the men of the circumcision. Paul is outlining for us here an unlikely alliance because then he goes and he talks about a few men who are Greeks. He lists Epaphras, who we've met before. And I'll just say this about Epaphras. Again, he's a faithful servant. He's the one who brought them the gospel. But, but notice here, he, he gives Epaphras the attribute, the, the activity that he describes of himself. Paul describes of himself. In the beginning of the letter, he said, I'm praying for you. We're praying for you. And here he says, Epaphras is praying for you. He preached them the gospel. Now he's not there. And in his absence, he's praying. Wouldn't you want a faithful minister like that? Did you, don't you feel that in the church when you know there's brothers and sisters around you who are praying for you? I think I, maybe I said it already, but this, last, this meeting, this exam that I went through last week, I never felt more prayed for in my life because you let me know. And even those of you who didn't, I know you were praying for me. Well, Epaphras is praying for them and specifically praying for them, not just that, that they would all just get along, but that they would be mature. We want to see gospel converts. We want to see people who were formerly walking in darkness now walking in light. But we don't just call people and then just bring them into church and say, all right, cool deal, now you're here. No, we want to see mature faith. All of us should want to see maturity in our faith, from the, from the oldest saint to the youngest saint. Remember, Paul is not just writing to, to, to leaders and, and important people in the church. He's writing to children. And Epaphras is praying for those children and for those older saints, that they would be mature in their faith, that they may stand fully assured in all the will of God, in all of God's word, in all of God, what God is, what he's done, and what he wants for them. Epaphras is praying for that. You know, it's one thing to get up and preach and lecture to people and tell them what they need to know and what they need to do, but do we pray for them? Husbands, 
do you, do you actually pray for your wives? Not just with your wives, which is good, and I recommend that, but do you pray for your wives? Wives, do you pray for your husbands? Do you pray for your children, for their many needs? Yes, but particularly for maturity in their faith. Because that's what Epaphras was praying for the church that he loved so well. He also lists two other men, and it, it's a bit... <laughs> funny putting them next to each other. Paul couldn't have possibly known at this time how funny it was. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Well, we do know quite a bit about Luke. Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Luke is a man who traveled with Paul extensively, was on the ship with Paul when it went down on their way to Rome. He is with Paul here, and as we find in 2 Timothy, which is, I believe, the last letter Paul actually writes, as he's going to his death, we find in 2 Timothy, he says, Luke alone is with me. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone else just abandoned him. Some were sent away. Some had to go away for ministry reasons. But the point is, Luke was there to the very end. Luke was with him. He was a beloved physician. He was a man of science. And if you read the Gospel of Luke or you read the book of Acts, you can tell that. I mean, he cares about history. He cares about method. But he's not just a man of science. He's a man of faith. And just as he, as a physician, perhaps was skillful in, in mending Paul's broken bones as he was stoned or perhaps helping him nourish himself as he was starved or after his shipwreck or his snake bite, we know that he was also a physician of souls, just as we know Jesus is the great physician. That's an opportunity we have as Christians for soul care. As your, pa- your pastors, that's, that's one of the things that I as a pastor want to be known as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone who cares for souls, who seeks to bring medicine to the sick and to, to bind up the broken because that's what Christ does. And that's what Christ was doing through Luke to Paul. Before we get to Demas, just another note there. You notice as we're going through this list, Paul is making it abundantly clear that gospel ministry is not a cowboy activity. It's not a lone ranger. Uh, it's not a lone ranger activity. It's not a a big great man, strong man doing big great things kind of kind of activity. No, it's actually something that depends on the whole church. Paul, we think of, we put him on a pedestal, but Paul is pretty clear in all of his letters. No, I'm weak. I can't even speak. When I show up, people say I'm not that great of a public speaker, but I've got this team around me that God has put in my life, and they support me. These men and women support me. They pray for me. They minister to me, and they help serve with me. And Luke was beloved as one of them. But then he does also list Demas, who we know less about, but he's also mentioned in 2 Timothy. In the very next verse, or in the very same breath as Luke, again. But Demas is not given the same commendation at that point. No, actually, Paul says to Timothy, Demas, in love with this present world, has left me. Demas has gone away. The fellowship has been ruptured. Now, what Paul says there doesn't mean that Demas, we don't know what Demas, the end of his story is like. We don't, it doesn't mean that he was utterly cast off. It doesn't mean he was apostate, per se. But can we ask of ourselves, what would it, how would we feel if someone said at the, as the epitaph, as the final statement of our, of our ministry, of their ministry, they said of us, in love with this present world, he left me. In love with this present world, He abandoned the ministry. She abandoned the faith. They left. They left. Demas left Paul. And so it should be sobering to us as a reminder. This is not, Demas, by the way, is not, as being listed here, we know he's not just some fringe participant in the church. He didn't wander into the church and then one day it was like, hey, where's Demas? Where did he go? No, Demas is a leader. Demas is a man of of great importance, at least for the church of Colossae and also for the other churches where he's listed in Paul's letter greetings. But here, um, we see him as a great leader. We know the end of his story, at least the end that that God has given us, and it should be a, a caution to us. Run the race, as Paul says. Run the race of faith. And don't fall in love with the world. That's what Paul's been saying in the book of Colossians. He says, you've been freed from this. 
You were crucified to worldly passions. Don't fall prey to it. We just sang about it, actually. All to Jesus I surrender. Apparently, Demas used to sing it, but he didn't believe it. Because to him, he did not surrender all. Even so, as Paul is listing these out, he's putting his, his Jewish companions and his, his Greek companions together, and he's saying in this moment, look at this ministry team. Look at these people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures. In fact, even different faiths originally. The Jews having the gospel in seed form in the Old Testament. The Greeks coming from pagan backgrounds now brought together in Christ. It's an unlikely alliance, but that's the alliance we find in the gospel. And that leads us then to a third group that he highlights here. And this is more about Paul's greetings to, to people, not just greetings from Paul. He lists for us a congregation, a series of congregations that are connected. He does say Epaphras is praying, not just for Colossae, which is his home church, but he's praying for the church at Laodicea and Heropolis. And then he says, give my greetings, verse 15, to the churches, the brothers at Laodicea, which brothers and sisters at Laodicea, and also to Nympha and the church in her house. Now, some translations change it to Nymphus and his house. There's a question about Nympha. It could be a boy's name, a girl's name. I believe that she's, she's a lady. I believe she's a leading lady. I believe that she has a, a, a household, a church building for them to meet in, and she's there ministering alongside the rest of them. Just because God doesn't call you to be a pastor or an elder doesn't mean that you don't have a part to play in the kingdom. And so he, he says, give my greetings to Nympha. And again, we don't know much about her, but if she's anything like Philemon, who is using his house in, in the church of Colossae as a place of worship, we know that she's a woman who refreshed the saints. That's what Paul says of Philemon. You refreshed the saints. You were hospitable to them. You gave them a place to meet and to gather and to worship and to break bread and fellowship together. He lists the church of, of Laodicea here. He says, give my greetings to them. He, he mentions this letter here, this letter from Laodicea. He says, make sure this letter, Colossians, Book of Colossians, which is not a book, it's a little scroll, it's a letter. He says, make sure that they read it as well, and make sure you read the letter from Laodicea. And we don't really know what this letter is. Two theories, I think, are compelling, one more than the other. The first theory is that this is a letter that was ultimately lost. And that's okay, because it wasn't meant for us. It was meant for them. It was God's word for them, sure, but it was God's word for them in that, partic in that particular time, Paul says, I want Laodicea to read it, I want Colossae to read it, but ultimately God says, nah, you know what, Pittsburgh, 20th, 21st century, they don't need to read it. And that's okay. That's how God works. There's not, we don't need to be worried about that. But I actually think, I, there's another theory that I think has even more evidence, and that's the letter from Laodicea is actually the letter we know as the letter from the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And there's a few reasons we have for that, a few external pieces of evidence. But one particular thing that, that does make sense, if that is true, that the book of Ephesians is the book to Laodicea, is that we see the Colossians and Ephesians next to each other have so much in common that they're almost like commentaries of each other. They're not the same, and the parts where they differ are important. They, they, they get at things from different, from different directions, but they're like commentaries of each other. And so, so if this is, in fact, the letter from Laodicea, then, then it's really good for us to know that we should be reading Ephesians alongside Colossians. Even if it's not the letter from Laodicea, we should be reading Ephesians alongside Colossians. If you're confused about Colossians, read Ephesians. And if you're confused about Ephesians, read Colossians. Because they comment on each other. They're interacting with each other. Add to that the book of Ephesians. Colossians is a very personal letter. Ephesians less so. And so the working theory, and I think it's compelling, is that Ephesians is kind of a circular letter. So there was a copy that went to Ephesus. There was a copy that went to Laodicea. And Paul says, oh, yeah, by the way, make sure you grab that one in Laodicea and bring it over here to Colossae as well, because I want you to read it too. In either case, the point is that we should be treasuring God's word, and we should be using God's word to, to, to interpret God's word. We call this the, 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 the rule of faith. This, this, is the, this is the way, the standard for interpretation Am I confused about what Bible says? Let me see what Bible says. Am I confused about what God says here? Let me see what God says there. And that's how we interpret the Bible. We don't cherry pick. We don't, we don't pour our meaning into it, but we want to see what God says, else, says elsewhere and build our interpretation based on that. There's one final note here about the church in Laodicea before we move on. Pastor Mike um, read for us from the book of Revelation chapter 3. 
In the book of Revelation, we see Jesus authoring seven letters to seven churches. His last letter is to, book, to the church in Laodicea. Now, just for some context, Colossians is Podunkville. Colossians is just, you know, small, small uh, potatoes compared to Laodicea. Laodicea is the city in the region. You know, the presbytery of, of that region would be Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. Hierapolis and Laodicea, they're the big dogs. They're, Laodicea is kind of more akin to, you know, the Oakland or the San Francisco, if you want to put it in those terms. So they're not insignificant. You'd think they'd have a pretty crack ministry team, that they'd be well off. They were very wealthy, we know that. They did have an earthquake around this time, um, which set them back a little bit, again, like San Francisco. But, you know, they're, they're a pretty well-off city. You'd think they're going to have a mega church there. They're going to have powerful saints there. They're going to have great gospel ministry there. But where's Laodicea today? Where's Laodicea today? The last reference to Laodicea we have is in the book of Revelation. And he says, Jesus says to them, you're not purifying. You're not refreshing. You're putrid to me. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You wonder if they, if they took the letters of Paul to heart. We know Nympha, he, she's greeted. We, we, we want to pray that her and other faithful saints were there holding to the gospel. But ultimately, this is, again, very sobering for us. Because it's possible to have the big, the ritz and the glamour. It's possible to have the big speakers and the great pastors and the great preachers and the great ministry teams and the great Sunday schools and the great, the great outreach efforts. And then at the very end for Christ to say, you're in danger of losing your faith. Paul even said it about himself. He said, he said, you know, I'm going around doing all this ministry stuff. You know, I need to preach the gospel to myself lest I find myself accursed. Jesus says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire. I want you to buy purchase. I want you to have purchase in me. Laodicea, Perhaps like Demas, you're being led astray by the world. Perhaps you're being led off by these desires. Perhaps you're just letting the gospel kind of fall to the wayside and letting it become an automatic part of your life instead of the vital thing that it is, my life in you. That's what I want you to buy, Jesus says. And so as we see Laodicea mentioned here, we want to be prayerful, not just for our church, but for the churches that we are in relationship with. And the friends that we have in churches, perhaps churches that are not connected to Delta Oaks or connected to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but we have friends in gospel-preaching churches, we want to be prayerful for them, that they will be faithful, and that they will, with us, buy that gold refined by fire, that we will, we will treasure God's word and God's grace, and that we will be people marked as those as servants, faithful servants to the king. Lastly, Paul gives his own personal greeting. Oh, actually, I almost missed. There's one, there's one more here. <laughs> I missed this one because this is the one about me. Uh, <laughs> he says to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. Again, we don't know much about Archippus. Uh, I think that Archippus, so we know Epaphras is in Rome. Epaphras was their pastor. Epaphras is now gone. I think Archippus is the guy who's raised up and who's in his place now. But well, whoever he is, Paul says, you guys, you Colossians, need to say to him, see that you fulfill the ministry you've received from the Lord. Paul says, I received ministry from the Lord. I, pray, I want you to pray that I fulfill my ministry, but I want you to tell Archippus to make sure he fulfills his. So we could read into that. We could say, well, maybe he just needed some encouragement. Maybe he was, de he was discouraged in his situation. He has all these false teachers pouring in, and, and maybe they, he needed to, to be encouraged by, by God. You know, fulfill the ministry. See to it. You fulfill the ministry. You've received this from the Lord. Or maybe he was falling derelict in his duty. And so Paul is coming alongside with a rebuke from God and saying, you received this from the Lord. See that you fulfill it. In either case, you see... Who is the mouthpiece for this message? It's the letter, sure, the letter has the text, but, but he's actually telling the Colossians, say to him, see that you fulfill this ministry. Again, he's talking to women, to men, and to children. Kids, if you're in here this morning, I want you to know that your thoughts matter to your pastor. Your opinions matter. If you ever have a question, if something is unclear or you're not really sure, you go to your parents, they don't have an answer for you, or you can feel free to come to the pastor. Talk to him. He's your pastor too. 
and encourage him, encourage me. And Pastor Mike, as he concludes his time here, encourage us to fulfill this ministry because it hasn't come from you ultimately. You called me, yes, but the call is really from God. So the church is called to encourage their pastor and at times even come alongside their pastor. The elders are, play a particular role in this. And the elders are some people you can go to. If you ever have a problem with the pastor or if you ever have an issue with the elders, you go to the pastor and you, you say, you know, I, I, want you to make, I just want to make sure that they fulfill the ministry because they received this from the Lord. And because we're a fellowship, united in Christ, baptized in his blood, we've all been buried with him, we've all been raised with him, we are all servants of him, so we can all get on the same page when it comes to this sort of thing. Knowing that we're not in it for self-conceit, we're not in it to, to be um, nitpicky or any of it, but that we're doing it from love. Paul calls the church, he says, in all things, bind together love. Bind together love. In love, he says to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry you've received in the Lord. And that brings us to the conclusion, which is Paul himself. We notice three things here about what Paul says. First, he says that he's writing this in his own hand. Now, the letter begins, he actually says, it's Paul and Timothy together. So Paul and Timothy both are writing this letter together, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the very words of God. It's possible that Timothy was the one actually taking down the notes. It's possible they had a secretary writing it up. That's typically how things were done. Paul does this frequently. He, he has a, a, a secretary come and, and write his letter out for him as he dictates it. But Paul makes a special point here. He says, this section right here, I'm writing this in my own hand. This is coming from me. Paul's ministry. He's never met the Colossians, but it's personal. It's personal. We should look for personal ministers, not, not people up on a pedestal that are unapproachable, but people that we can come to and, and know. That's what Paul wants. He wants to know the Colossians, even from a distance. They don't have email, they don't have text, they don't have FaceTime, but he's doing everything in his power to get to know the Colossians and to show the Colossians a little bit about himself as well. He says, I write this with my own hand. You can trust it. It's come from me personally. But then he says, remember my chains. And we could take that in one sense to mean, you know, don't forget that I'm in prison because of the gospel. Don't forget about me. We, we, we don't want to forget about our brothers and sisters who are suffering for the sake of the gospel, both in this country and around the world. It's so easy to, to hear a news story about something going on in Ukraine or something going on in, in, um, in uh, uh, Nigeria, for example. had a, a friend in seminary who was from Nigeria, and we'd have it in prayer group. He would talk about these horrible things that are going on, and you, know, you, you pray about them, and then how easy it is just to forget about them. But Paul says, remember my chains. I think that's a call for prayer, but I think more than that, Paul is actually not just telling them to remember he's in prison, but he's telling them to remember why he's in prison. His point is not to garner sympathy. His point is to say, this gospel is worth it. Remember my chains. Remember what I'm willing to go through for this gospel. Remember what I, that I have skin in the game and that I want you to as well. Remember my chains, that the Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Remember that Christ has died on a cross to cover our sins. He has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his throne, of his power. He has taken us from darkness to light and he has made reconciliation. Forgiveness of sins. So I don't care about these little chains. I don't care about these Roman guards. I don't care about the fact that I could die, and in fact, Paul will, according to church tradition, die in Rome for the sake of the gospel. He says, I don't care because Christ has set me free. Remember my chains. And then he leaves with this little phrase, again, so easy to, to glance over. He says, grace be with you. That's what it's been about this whole time, right? Our whole series through the book of Colossians, this full fellowship in the kingdom of God, how we entered the kingdom and how we stay in the kingdom and how we grow to fullness and maturity in the kingdom is all by the grace of God. Paul, as God's minister, says, grace be with you. Not just a wish, but a pronouncement. 
It's not just a wish. It's a pronouncement. It's a declaration. He says, if Christ is with you, grace is with you. It's like a benediction. At the end of our service, we have a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Pastor Mike, when he says that, he's not just, he's not just hoping for that, although we do hope for that. But he's declaring it because he knows the certain promise in Christ. If we have Christ, we have everything. If we have Christ, we have God's grace. If we have Christ, we have the forgiveness of our sins. We are justified. We have restored relationship with God. And we have all things needful for life and spiritual fullness in him. For Paul, it didn't mean the road would be easy. None of the fellowship, actually, had an easy road. But the fact is, they knew that they had a lasting inheritance, an abiding one. They knew that their Christ was on the throne, that Jesus, that God the Son was on the throne and that he rules justly and well, that he was reconciling all things to himself. So I ask you this morning, as you maybe think back on the book of Colossians, as we we turn the page literally and metaphorically on this sermon series, what does that mean for you to be a servant in Christ's kingdom? What does that fullness mean for you? What is your hope in this life? Is it found in these worldly things? Is it found in maybe even good things that support you? Or is it found in the fact that you've been buried and raised with Christ? And if you have been buried and raised with Christ, if you're trusting in him, do you find that fullness of fellowship here with your brothers and sisters in Christ? We're a team. Sounds like, a, like, a, like an employer giving a speech, right? But it's true, right? We are a team. We are more than that, a family. We're brothers and sisters brought together by the same Christ, saved from sins in the same way, by the same Savior, for the same purpose, to be to the glory of God. And so as we pray now, this morning, I, that, that's my prayer for this church, that we would be that fellowship. And that we would have that love that the Colossian church had and that Paul prayed they would have even more. That love that they would have for all the saints throughout time and space. May God give us his grace to have that kind of fellowship with him. A fellowship that we have not just with each other, but with our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, as those who, as you write in the book of Ephesians, were children of wrath, sons of disobedience, as those people you have called us into your marvelous light, we were filthy and you cleansed us. We were naked and you clothed us. You made us not just, not just your servants, but your friends, your sons. You brought us into your fellowship by your beloved son, so that we may in him be called by you, beloved. We pray that you would apply your word to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. That we would not just know fellowship with you, but we would know that that fellowship entails love, and fellowship with one another. We pray that we would be a church marked by that love, that people on the outside would look in and say that we are known by our love, that we have a fullness that the world cannot offer, a fullness that comes from knowing that we have been forgiven and restored and reconciled. In a world fractured by so many different allegiances, cultures, personalities, even ethnicities, and there's so many tensions in our nation today, we pray that we would be an oasis of the gospel. And we ask this, Father, not only of ourselves, but of all the churches. Churches in San Jose, and in Berkeley, and San Francisco, and Roseville, and Battle Mountain, churches that we we know, friends that we have, whether in Brentwood, or in Walnut Creek, or in Martinez, or in, here in Pittsburgh, Lord, we pray for all of the churches that they would know the fullness that we have in Jesus Christ. And that we would all bear our lights and shine them brightly, Lord.
that we who are buried in Christ would know that we are raised in him, that we would put aside, put off the sins of the flesh, and that we would put on the lovely virtues you've given us, the benefits that we have, knowing that we are united to our Savior. Save us, Lord, we ask. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.